morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, welcome in Jesus' name to our worship service. We are glad that you are here with us. Uh, you'll see on the, the slide deck here just the announcements we're going to go through. Uh, you've got the Tuesday morning men's Bible study at Underwood at the uh, cafe, and then the ladies' study at Short and Schultz at 4.30, and then we have our usual Wednesday night ministries with confirmation at 6, and then youth group at 7 o'clock. Uh, next Sunday, wanted to really highlight this as well, we have uh, Andrew and Alexis Olson and their kids coming to share uh, about uh, Bible translating with their organization, They Need the Bible. Uh, that's going to be taking place. Uh, he'll share a little bit during the service, uh, and then he'll be sharing during the Sunday school hour. And if you uh, aren't able to make it for that, uh, if you'd like to hear more, he'll also be doing a meal uh, for supper at Zion Sarpsburg that evening. So uh, please be in prayer. He's a missionary that we've supported in the past, and uh, he's working on Bible translating now. Uh, you'll see that February newsletters are available in the back for you to pick up, or you can go to our church website and take a look there. Uh, just for you to reference, if you'd like to receive it by mail, please let us know, and we will get that to you as well. Um, I think that's all the announcements that I have, if, unless there's something I'm forgetting. Excellent. Let's stand and greet one another this morning. The call to worship this morning is from Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 16 to 18. I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. I welcome you to grab your hymnals or to follow along with 228 as we begin our worship service with Father again in Jesus' name we need. Hymn 228. turn in a time of prayer and welcome any prayer requests that you might have this morning. Many of you know Ruthie Machinsky passed away last Monday and pray for her daughter Mary Jo and family and friends. The uh, funeral is here on Friday at 1 o'clock. Visitation is at noon. But uh, pray for the Machinsky and for the daughter Mary Jo. Um, we're just a blessing. 
the name again? The Brittany. Brittany. The Brittany. The Brittany with that. Thank you. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the day that you've given to us. We thank you for uh, your continued blessings for us, for provision, for protection, for uh, in a warm place to be able to come and worship you today. And we uh, thank you in Jesus' name uh, for the forgiveness that is ours through the death and resurrection of your Son. Lord, as we have gathered together to worship, we'd ask that you would calm our hearts and our minds. Lord, as we take this time to receive rest, uh, to enjoy uh, time together as well after the service, thinking of Sunday school as well, and other ministries that we have going on at Tortoise Old and then as a parish and then others, or as we consider others that are gathering and worshiping you today, uh, we thank you for the work that you have done in our hearts, Lord, as a, um, in, and even among us as a church. We pray that you give us eyes to see that work, and Lord, uh, spirit of thankfulness, Lord, to continue to proclaim what you've been doing. Uh, Lord, to be able to share that with the people around us. We thank you for the, uh, again, the invitation, opportunity to turn to you in prayer together as uh, your people. Uh, we thank you for uh, for good news uh, for Brittany, Lord, with the um, pregnancy again. We pray for uh, peace of mind for her, for her family, for her friends as well, Lord, as she uh, hopes to carry this uh, to full term, Lord, especially with what has happened recently in the past. Uh, we pray that you would uh, provide for her in that way. We think of the Machinsky family, Lord, as uh, we prepare for uh, the funeral uh, on Friday, Lord, of, uh, of Ruby, and we would just ask, Heavenly Father, that you would uh, speak through that time, Lord, even during the time of preparation for this service, uh, that people would be able to hear, uh, again, the work that you have accomplished for us, and the good news of eternal life that we have in you. Lord, we would ask for traveling mercies as well for Sid and Diane as they head out to Oregon. We pray that you would uh, allow them safe travels, Lord, that they would be able to enjoy their time out there, that they'd be able to return safely. We think of our missionaries, Lord, that are listed. We think of uh, the Olsons as they are going to be coming here next week. Uh, we prayed already for that time that you would bless that uh, as a terrific opportunity to be able to make connections, Lord, and learn more about what you are doing through uh, this Bible translating work. Lord, we think of others that are in need. Uh, we pray for peace in the world around us. We think of the Ukraine especially, uh, and we pray for peace there. We think of other places in the world where there is fighting and wars and, and tensions uh, that are going on politically and military. militarily speaking. Lord, we would ask that you would provide uh, peace and wisdom, Lord, on, on behalf of the leaders that are uh, involved in that. We pray for wisdom for our leaders here in our country as well. Uh, we continue to pray for uh, those that are elected. We think of those in Congress. We think of our president. Lord, we think of our governor as well and, and other elected officials at the local level. Uh, we would continue to pray for them as well. Lord, as we continue our service, we would take this opportunity as well and would silently confess our sins before you. says that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We claim that promise of forgiveness, Lord, in Jesus' name, and thank you for the work that you've done for us on the cross. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. The words are up on the screen. Or your bullet. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. 
He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Wait, the kids to come up at this time, so come on up, you guys. stronger together, okay, when, we're, when we get along, when we do things together, we work together, but we're stronger together, and the person that brings us together is the person of Jesus Christ. That's one thing we have in common with every other Christian in the world. You know that there are boys and girls all over the world that look different than you, that talk a different language, that are worshiping Jesus right now? You know that? But when we come together, God makes us one in Him through the cross. And uh, it's what He wants to do to accomplish uh, His work through the church and through our lives. It's all over about Jesus. It makes it just as sweet as this, but it's better than that. Okay? So let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you desire for. 
your people to dwell together in unity. And we thank Jesus how you love each one of us. And we pray, Father, for uh, just for your word that it would teach all of us. And I pray for these young children and their families, too. And as they learn in Sunday school, that, Jesus, we would understand that everything that we have comes from you. And, Father, that our relationships with other people would be strong because of you. Bless each of these children and their families together now. We pray each one here in the gifts that are shared in Jesus' name. Amen. So have the ushers come forward too for the offering. riches of Christ, and to bring to light for everyone 
What is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things? So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he, was, that has, he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Maybe see it. Together sing, open the eyes of our heart, and then mighty to say it.
Drafted in the NHL. Huge guy. And here's Riley Batson, well, shorter than I am, maybe about a buck sixty and buck seventy, and weight drops his gloves. <laughs> and Isaac was on the ice too. And you're supposed to protect your teammates. And so he was dancing with the guy for a while too. Not fighting, but make it look like you're helping. That's what you do, you just make it look like it. He's not a, not a fighter. But divisions and things like that. And what happened then is his line mate, Riley, they thought, you know, had to go to the locker room because he dropped his gloves. Well, it was such an egregious penalty that the ref didn't even give him a penalty for that. But he skated to the locker room. And then uh, he was looking at the game going to get started, and the guy said, oh, no, you're back out here. The ref said you're out. So he came out, but he came out with the wrong helmet on. He went to the locker room. They had a black helmet, they had a white helmet. The crowd was cheering, and all of a sudden he skates off again. He comes back with the black helmet. And on and on the story goes. It was entertaining, but... Things boil over, you know, and there's disagreements and fights and things like that. This situation between the Gentiles and the Jews was very, very serious. Pastor Dan pointed out some examples in the New Testament. The Jews would go around the area where the woman at the well was at, or the, the Good Samaritan story that they'd go a different way, just any way to avoid them. Um, avoid the Samaritans. The Apostle Paul wrote in one of his epistles that we'll get to is that some of the Jewish people called the Gentiles dogs. You know, it was, it was bad. It was very bad. And we see here the Apostle Paul called by God to bring the Jews and the Gentiles together in the unifying factor, just like it is today in any racial dissension or any disagreements, the unifying factor is always Jesus, and it's always the cross, and it's always the gospel. I want us to keep that in mind. He is the one that unifies us. The verse that I'm kind of using as a basis for the message is verse 6. This mystery that Paul is proclaiming is that the Jews are fellow heirs and members of the same body and they are partakers of the promise in Christ through the gospel. Partakers of the promise in Christ through the gospel. And I want to share these four points. First of all, that the mystery, and I'll explain that, what it is, the message of the gospel is known through his word. God conveys the message of salvation through his word. Secondly, that this mystery is made clear, and the Apostle Paul clarifies this relationship. And how does he make it clear? It's through preaching. And how is it further made through? Through the church. And this letter was written to the church at Ephesus, but it was also circulated in, in other churches. Before we get into those points, I want to understand and, and to think about the heart of the Apostle Paul here, because as he writes in verse 1, he says what? I, for this reason, I, a prisoner for Jesus Christ, I, I'm a prisoner on behalf of you, the Gentiles. You who are outside of Christ, I'm in prison for you and for this message. Now I want to just think about that. Because later on, in verse 13, he sums this up. And after he clarifies the gospel and the grace God given him to preach the gospel, he says, I ask you then, don't lose heart for what I am suffering, because it's for your glory. And so we see here the heart of a missionary, the heart of a pastor, the heart of a believer. To see people brought together, and the unifying factor is the person of Jesus Christ. And it's very interesting because much of this book, chapter 1, much of chapter 2, are called the worship verses where a prayer that he's praying. He's praying for this congregation. He wants the 
eyes of their heart to be open. We just sang about that. And now, in these verses, there's like a parenthesis as he stops and he explains his purpose. It's like a long parenthesis, a break, and he explains this. He says, the message, this mystery, was given to him, and he is a steward of God's grace. He's a steward of God's grace. And this word steward is very, very interesting. It literally means ordering your household, or administering your household, or responsibility. They're, they're stewardship. God has given given a, a, a mother and a father a household. You steward your household. You manage it. You administer. There's responsibility. And then he transmits this to the church. And he's a steward of God's grace. It's not like he's keeping God's grace back or withholding it. But this is the precious good news of the gospel of what Jesus says God has done for us in Christ. He's a steward of that. And it's for the building up of the body of Christ. Steward of grace, the content of what he's a steward of is God's grace. And the Apostle Paul goes over and over back to that in God's power in his life, in his ministry. And for us today, the opportunity to serve, the opportunity to share the gospel with others, it's his work and it's God's grace and his strength that helps us to do that. In verses 3 through 5, we see here, as partakers of the promise, this gospel is explained, and it's known through his word. In verse 3, I'm a steward of this grace, and he says, How the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have briefly written. What is he talking about? He's talking about mystery here. He's not talking about a, a novel or something mysterious, or something that we can't understand or can't know anything about. But what he's really getting at here is God continually to reveal the plan for the Israelites, for the Gentiles, and for all people. And it's an unveiling, or it's making this more clear with precision what was revealed by God. And it's written down in the scriptures. Revelation that comes from God's Holy Spirit. In verses 4 and 5, he says this. When you read this, you can perceive my insights into the mystery of Christ. Which was made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Holy Spirit. Here's a beautiful text that talks about God's plan of revealing himself to the writers of Scripture, the Old Testament, the New Testament. And we have the tremendous advantage of looking back at the cross and what Jesus has done for us. In the Old Testament, the message of salvation was clear. We're saved by grace through faith. Faith in the promise of what Jesus would do on the cross. But it's made more clear. Clearer and clearer. Here is God's plan. Clarity comes in verse 6. And I love the way Paul writes. When he talks about the mystery, he says this. The mystery is... Then he says that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ. And you know, there was tremendous division between those people groups. In the Old Testament as well. And I'll get to some examples in just a minute. Whenever you read the Old Testament, and if you see a I-T-E at the end of a name, it's most likely a Gentile nation. The Hittites, the Moabites, not the Norwegianites or the Swedites. But there's always, there's a, there's a clear delineation there between God's chosen people and others and nations. And there were physical boundaries, but 
there was tremendous bondage between them spiritually as well. So in the Old Testament, did God not care about the Gentiles? Not one. He did. The Israelites, God's chosen people, the instrument who Christ would come through that nation. And I think it's fascinating to, to look at this because sometimes we get that idea that what, what about us? What if we were living in the Old Testament? What if we were a Moabite or a Hittite? The promise that God gave to Abraham says you're going to be a blessing and through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Not just the Israelites. We see a number of examples in the Old Testament. In Exodus 4, verses 24 through 26. Moses married Zipporah, the daughter of the priest of Midian. Zipporah and her father Jethro were both Gentiles. Moses' father-in-law played a huge part in his ministry. <coughs> it's in Exodus 17, when Moses is going to say, how am I going to do all this work? And Jethro says, here's Aaron. Here's others. They'll hold your hands up. Gentiles. Rahab in Joshua 2, verse 1. Rahab, the harlot. She was a Canaanite. She hid the spies. In the book of Ruth, Ruth was a Moabite who married an Israelite. In 2 Samuel verses 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 18, it says, Entire Gentile nations submitted to David, while his own Absalom was in rebellion. In the book of Esther, Esther verse uh, 8, verse 17, it says, Many people in the land became Jews. And the book of Romans spends a lot of time talking about how God brought together the Jews and the Gentiles, how he brought us and grafted us into him. So we have these examples in the Old Testament, in the New Testament as well. Paul was called as a preacher to the Gentiles. And he was in prison for this. He takes this ministry very, very seriously. Like we too should in our lives. In verse 7 he says, Of this mystery, according to the gift of God's grace, I was made a minister. And was given me this by the working of his power. This was Paul's heart. I want to see as many people go to heaven as I can. I want to see as many people who don't get along get along. And I don't care. I am going to preach the gospel. I'm going to share God's word. I'm going to love people because this is serious business and this is God's mysterious grace that comes to us through the person of Jesus Christ. It's known through preaching. And Paul clarifies this about his lot in life. And he does this oftentimes. And in verse 8 he says this. To me, a minister of the gospel, he says, Though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles. And this is what he preaches, and this is a wonderful statement here, the unsearchable riches of Christ. He says, I'm the very least of all the saints. He understood his position in relation to a holy God. He understood that his ministry was all from God. And he had the privilege, like we and all of us have the privilege, to share with people the unsearchable riches of Christ. We cannot plumb the depths of the riches of Christ. 
It's hard for us to give words to the riches of Christ. And in chapter 1, he talked about all those things. I'll repeat them. That we're chosen by him. We're predestined to adoption as sons and daughters. We're redeemed. We're given an inheritance. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. This is the riches of what Christ offers. Salvation and eternal life. In verse 9, he explains this as well. To bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for all ages in God who created all things. I want to bring this to light. I bring the gospel. And no other man in the, almost all of scripture, especially the New Testament, does much church planting, preaching, soul care, ministry, and travel. And at the end of his life, he says what? I'm the chief of all sinners. To explain his apostleship at the end of his life. you got to believe me, I'm an apostle. He shared this, and he wrote this when he was in prison, because he loved everybody, the Jews, the Gentiles. And why did he do this? Why did he bring this to light for everyone? And this is a beautiful thing here. Because we come in here. We come in in the whole story here, but it says this. So that, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to rulers and authorities in heavenly places. He says in verse 11, This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Paul is making a statement here about the importance of the church of Jesus Christ. There is no greater, I'll call it an organism, that's living organization than the church. There are many, many great service organizations, millions of dollars given away to help people with different things, but there's no greater organization than the Christian church. And you know what happens sometimes? People drag the church through the mud. Why they're just, I don't need the church. I don't need, you know, whatever. We're missing out. Paul said, I really want people to understand what it's all about. And I'm so thankful for our parish, and our church. And this text really sharpens too, doesn't it? What I'm going to do as a pastor, what we're going to do together is to tell people about the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? Pastor Steve Carlson used to say this. Let's talk up the church. Yeah, we might always have, we don't have a perfect church. No one does. If you find the perfect church, don't go there because you might ruin it. That's what my mom, my dad's cousin used to say. My mom did. But we understand that this is, right here, we're sitting, we're the bride of Christ. And Jesus died for us and for the church. Let's lift it up. Like it says in Ephesians 5, so that he might present the bride in all her glory, without spot, without wrinkle. This is according to the eternal purpose that he realized in Christ Jesus. Did you note that over and over? By the grace given to me, or in Christ Jesus, or for this reason, it's realized in Christ Jesus. And friends, when the church is not about Christ Jesus, and about his word, and about the gospel, it's not the church. It's just another organization. Another group of people get together. It's another social group. Paul makes this very clear. He lifts up the body of Christ. And a lot of Ephesians is about that. It's encouragement to the body of Christ. And he says because of that, because of the grace of God given, he says, do not lose heart. Is that an awesome word? Don't lose heart. And I like this too. He says, don't lose heart because of what I'm suffering, because I'm in jail. It's to your glory. 
Because the name of Jesus will be lifted up. Isn't that an awesome thing? I don't care. Shipwrecked. Paul is beaten. Whipped. Put in jail. Rejoice, Lord, always. Again, I say rejoice, he writes. He says, don't worry. In Galatians, the book we just finished, he says, don't grow weary in well-doing. For in due season, you'll read. You don't think. I think that's a good word for us. It's a good word for us to go from today. Because when we see the world, and we see people not getting along, or nations fighting, and hockey players fighting, most part of the game, we see all these things happening in politics and in the world. We go, how can we fix this? Well, we really can't. The only one that can is Jesus. And aren't you thankful today that the gospel has been proclaimed to us so that we, like the Gentiles, are grafted into him? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and the encouragement that we receive and how it too challenges our hearts and causes us to grow. And Lord, I pray that you would put within us, Father, just a humble a desire and love for people and Lord, that we would share the unsearchable riches of Christ. You say in your word, I, even if I be lifted up, Jesus, you said this, we thank you for that. I will draw men to myself. Continue to do that in and through us. We thank you, Jesus, for your unsearchable riches now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Partakers of God's grace, another word we have for that is fellowship. And we're going to sing about the fellowship we have in Christ. Our last hymn, let's stand together and sing What a Fellowship. 542.
lift up his countenance upon him and give him peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. 